cycling has changed and adapted since its beginning. So in this video, I'm gonna run you through a few professional cyclists that have helped change the shape of our sport to what it is today. Let's kick off with a man who's done arguably more than anyone else to help change the face of our sport. You may recognize the name Campagnolo, and it was Tullio who started the legendary Italian bicycle component manufacturer. Before he started Campagnolo, Tullio raced at the highest level, competing in Milan San Remo and Tour de Lombardy, just to name a few. But it was on November the 11th, 1927, where Tullio had an experience that would change bike racing. He was leading a race solo in the Dolomites, where he came to a point where he needed to change gear. In those days, you had to take your wheel out to be able to change gear. Tullio had incredibly cold hands and numb fingers and wasn't able to undo the wing nuts to be able to get the wheel out. So he thus had to retire from the race. Three years on and a lot of research, Tudio came up with the first cam mechanism quick release skewer. And in 1930, this became standard across all bike manufacturers and is still used to this day. Tudio wasn't done there and continued to innovate throughout his entire life. And in 1949, he came up with the Grand Sport twin cable parallelogram rear derailleur that became a prototype for just about every rear derailleur out on the market today. Thanks to Campagnolo, we're able to change gear easily and also take a rear wheel out to change a puncture, even with the coldest of hands. We've got another tech innovator now, the iconic American Greg LeMond. The first American to win the World Championships and the Tour de France, not once, but three times. Where Greg led, the, well, the Pro Peloton followed. Le Mans was the first rider to win the Tour de France on a carbon fiber bike, which is now the most used bike material in the Pro Peloton. But most importantly, he introduced aerodynamics to the Pro Peloton. In the 1989 Tour, Le Mans went into the last stage in a 50 second deficit to Laurent Fignon and over a 24.5 kilometer time jar, making up that time gap while it was near impossible. But Le Mans turned up on the start line with an aero helmet and clip-on bars. These allowed Le Mans to make up the 50 seconds to Fignon and also surpass it and he ended up winning the Tour de France by eight seconds. These days we know aerodynamics is incredibly important in pro cycling and so I guess we've got, well, Le Marican to thank for that. Now moving on from Greg Le Mans aero bars, I think we should make the transition into cycling kit. And it was Tony Meyer that invented the first Lycra shorts for cyclists. He got the idea from a Swiss ski team. Arguably, Meyer could have made this list himself because, well, he was actually a cyclist. But we've gone for the man who introduced Assos shorts to the pro peloton, and that was Peter Post. Peter Post was a Dutch pro cyclist whose career spanned through the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. He enjoyed some great success on the road, but was mostly known for his six day racing, where he became one of the best six day racers of all time, winning 65 six day events throughout his entire career. When he retired, he became the TI rally manager. And while there, the team won pretty much everything worth winning, from the Paris Bay to the World Championships to a Tour of Flanders, and well, the list goes on. In 1977, Post approached Meyer to create Lycra shorts for his TI rally team, who then became the first team to wear Lycra cycling kit. Back in those days, it caused great confusion to, well, all the pro peloton at that time. But as we know, to this day, that Lycra is the most used material in cycling kit. 
Alongside the technological innovation, there are also riders that fundamentally changed the way the races were ridden. Mario Cipollini was a professional cyclist, and he was also known for having an incredibly flamboyant character, and he, well, he showed everyone through what he wore. Cipollini was regarded as one of the best sprinters of his generation, and arguably one of the best of all time. And while the fashion trends came and went, there was one thing that did stick, and that was the way he raced with his team, namely the lead-out train. Cipollini wasn't the first to use his team to discourage late attacks and also to put him in the perfect position for him to launch his sprint. But he really did perfect the art of the lead-out. And the sight of the Seiko train delivering the Lion King to sprint glory was one of the defining images of the era. And now, to this day, every pro team out there uses that lead out to help deliver their team sprinter to glory. Very much using Cipollini's wisdom. <laughs> Rob Hales is maybe a name a lot of you might not be familiar with. But if we're talking riders that were fundamentally way ahead of their time, then Rob Hales has to make the list. He was predominantly a track rider, winning three Olympic championships and 16 national titles. And he also saw great success on the road. And that's where we really saw how fundamentally forward thinking he really was. Hales was never happy with just accepting his cycling kit the way it was. And he continued to adapt it and change it. And he was actually one of the first pros to wear skin suits in a cycling road race. And while he did so, he actually sewed pockets to the back of his skin suit so he was able to hold food in it for those longer races. He liked to ride really narrow bars and crafted little bits onto the end of his brake hoods so he could get in a more aerodynamic position. He was the first person to invent the arse saver out of carbon fibre. And what about the trigger shifter that allowed him to shift gear a lot easier while sprinting? Now, Rob Hales did come under a lot of ridicule during his career, but it's quite clear now that he knew exactly what he was on about. Our next trendsetter could be a contentious one, and a man with, well, not the best reputation. But we can't deny that Lance came up with some groundbreaking techniques that, well, didn't involve what he put in his body. So here we're going to talk about Lance's iconic cadence. The accepted wisdom for as long as gears have been around is to select the biggest gear and push it as hard as you can to be able to go as fast as possible. And if you selected a smaller gear, this would mean you would get dropped and ultimately go slower. But Armstrong found if he selected a higher gear, meaning if he selected one where he could pedal at a higher cadence, he was able to put more pressure on his cardiovascular system and less on his muscles, thus being more efficient and ultimately faster. If you compared footage of him and Jan Ulrich, for example, then you would see a massive difference. This was a massive talking point in the 90s and is still a big talking point to this day. Moving on to some more recent trends. And it's impossible not to mention cycling's favourite buzzword, marginal gains. And also Britain's first ever Tour de France winner, Bradley Wiggins. When Team Sky first started in 2010, a big part of their ethos was to look at the minuscule details. Led by Dave Brailsford, they really honed in on the little things, from the training to the bikes to even the sleeping. But the issue with marginal gains methodology is that it came across quite mechanical. So their signing the funny, charismatic kid from Kilburn was the perfect way to be able to sell marginal gains to the wider public. And nearly nine years on from Wiggins' time trial and tour win, marginal gains is popping up everywhere, even beyond cycling, in business and, well, all walks of life. And now that is a big trend. There you have it, some real trendsetters that have helped to develop our sport. But if you think that there is a trendsetter out there that you think that deserves to be on this list, then make sure you put them in the comment section below. And if you did enjoy this video, then give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to see some more trends of 2019, then why don't you check out this video just over there.